welcome to My Brain is a Wonderland, the podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. You're here with your host, Emily, today, and we are going to be doing the second episode of my new monthly series, Film Fixation, where I basically do a movie rewatch recap episode of a movie that I've either hyperfixated on in the past or are currently hyperfixating on. Last month was Freaky Friday, so if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to it. Today, we are going to do an October scary-themed movie, and it's going to be Scream. For next month in November, it's going to be a Thanksgiving-themed movie, and for December, it's going to be a Christmas-themed movie. So let's get started. I do want to say that I did not watch this movie when it first came out. It came in, uh, out in 1996. I was 10 years old, so completely inappropriate and not something that would have been on my radar at all. I was a very, and still am, jumpy kind of scared kid. And so I didn't like horror movies, even as a teenager, even as an adult. I've tried to watch American Horror Story. I can't do it. I'm watching the latest season, still a struggle, I'm just trying to stick around for Kim K, but um, really struggle with horror movies. The first horror movie I ever saw at the movie theater, or at all, was the movie Valentine with David Boreanaz, which I'm sure you've all wiped from your memory. It's a terrible movie, I only went to see it because I was obsessed with Buffy. It has an 11% on Rotten Tomatoes, so there you go. But when I was around, I want to say, 16 maybe, I won a local competition at the mall. And the competition was to design like an outfit or something. I forget if it was themed, I'm not sure. And I basically won the competition. And the prize was a two-year, I think it was two years, a two-year card to the movie theater in the mall to have me and one other person go to the movies for free whenever I wanted. So I would just go to the movie theater, say, I want to go to this movie at 12 p.m., whatever, me and my friend. And then when they would ask for payment, I would hand this card over and it would be free. So during those, that year to two years, I pretty much saw every movie that came out in the movie theaters. Sometimes I would go and see two movies at a time. And then after that, at the well, actually, at the current time, I was working at Woolworths in the entertainment um, department. So I had access to a lot of movies. And then I started working at Blockbuster, where I would pick up all the latest movies that came out and a lot of older movies. And I'd always been into movies. I love movies. But really, the 2000s is where I became obsessed with movies. And I really don't know the first time that I saw Scream. I couldn't tell you. I don't know if I rented it, saw it on cable, saw it on TV. I'm not sure. But as soon as I saw it, I was obsessed. It is, in my opinion, It launched a genre. It launched the parody, self-aware, almost comedy horror genre. So the Halloweens, the, um, uh, you know, the Elm Street, that one. You know, I don't even know my horror movies, guys. Seriously, I just don't like horror movies. Um, It wasn't like that. And even movies that came out around the same time weren't like that. I Know What You Did Last Summer is a very serious movie. There's no comedy. There's no self-awareness. It's just like a serious teen horror movie. So this movie was super accessible to me. It wasn't huge on the uh, horror that was like awful and difficult to watch. And it had great acting, great writing, Um, And lots of popular culture references, which I was just super into. So let's get started on the beginning of the movie. So we open with a ringing landline and Drew Barrymore picks up, who I would say is still very famous today. She has her talk show, but back then was especially like super big deal that we see Drew Barrymore in this role. She picks up the phone. She answers, and there's a male voice on the end, and she's kind of asking, like, who is this? Who are you trying to reach? And she's kind of flirting with him. He's flirting with her a little bit. It's giving sex line vibes, to be honest. I don't know. It's a super interesting opener, because I feel like this hasn't been done before. Her hair color is absolutely terrible. If you know color analysis, it's freaking awful. And she's got this, like, cream shirt on, sweater on. Her brown lipstick is 
perfection for the 90s. Um, I am wondering, though, if that was a conscious choice, the really strange hair color, the blonde with the cream, because she's giving kind of Hitchcock vibes. Icy blonde Hitchcock vibes. If you don't know what that is, go watch a Hitchcock movie. He loved Icy Blondes. Grace Kelly was his muse. And a lot of them had this kind of, I don't know, the hair didn't always work with their skin color but he loved the icy blonde vibe. So I'm wondering if that is what they were going for, and I love it, because it's so iconic now, even though she looks kind of strange. It's super iconic. She puts the phone down on this guy, he calls back, it's him again, da-da-da-da. They're going back and forth, back and forth. We see her house, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mentioned in the last Film Fixation episode, all these movies in the 90s and the early 2000s, and maybe even now, I don't know, I'll have to watch while I'm watching a movie, they give millennials the feeling that you're going to own this house one day. You are going to own this gigantic house, and just by being, you know, a stay-at-home mom with a dad who works, or you're both working, but you're not execs, it's just normal, you can totally have this life. Yeah, keep dreaming. We see a swing outside the house, and it's swinging like someone just got off it. Or maybe the wind is pushing it. I don't know. Drew goes to uh, the stove and she's making popcorn in one of those little silver metal bags, like aluminum bags. The phone rings again. She's frustrated. It's that same guy. Like, why do you keep calling back? They go back and forth. She says she's getting ready to watch a scary movie. And the caller says, if she likes scary movies, what's her favorite? She says Halloween with the Queen, Jamie Lee Curtis. She was in my last film, Fixation, Freaky Friday. I've never seen Halloween. Seriously, I cannot deal with scary movies. But she is a queen. I love her in everything that I have seen. And again, he, he's just sounding like super porny, like, you know, trying to flirt with her. I mean, honestly, <laughs> if I'd picked up the phone and was home alone, I would have put it down and like maybe called the cops or I, I don't even know. It's kind of creeping me out. He asks her to guess what his favorite scary movie is and she says Nightmare on Elm Street and he asks her if she has a boyfriend and she's like, why? You want to take me out on a date? I think she says she doesn't have a boyfriend or maybe just by saying, do you want to take me out on a date? He assumes she doesn't have a boyfriend and then he wants to know her name. We see her put two VHS tapes up, up on one of the fattest TVs you've ever seen. If you're watching this movie, it's hilarious because you're looking at the house like, wow, super rich, right? Mm -hmm. And then you see the TV and you're like, wait, what? Like compared to now, but that is how our TVs looked, like gigantic cardboard boxes. Then she says, why do you want to know my name? And he's like, he wants to know who he's looking at. And that is when the vibe changes. Drew Barrymore's like, uh, you know, you can tell she's immediately worried. She hears a dog barking, which is never good, but the house seems isolated. It's kind of weird. Like, I don't think they have a dog, but like, where is that dog barking from? I don't know. She turns on the outside light to look outside. She doesn't see anything and she locks the door and the guy says on the phone, don't hang up on me. And she does. Which, FYI, these are glass French doors. Locking your glass French door means almost nothing. Very smashable, very accessible. I mean, you could just smash the window and unlock it by putting your hand inside. I don't know if this is just like the poor person in me talking, you know? I just don't like glass doors at all. They're so easy to get into, and locking it means literally almost nothing. She goes back to her popcorn. It's burning. That's called a tension builder, people. And her phone rings again. It starts to get a little stressed on the phone. She's freaked out, but he's like weirdly freakishly calm, the guy on the phone. She puts it down again, and the phone is ringing again. And she picks it up, and she shouts down the phone. She's like, listen, asshole. But his demeanor has changed, and he calls her. I just want to say, preface this, sorry, there's going to be some swearing in this episode, just because of the nature of the movie. And he calls her a little bitch and says, I'll gut you like a fish if you hang up again. And now Drew is in the game. She knows what's up. 
She runs to all her doors and starts locking them. Again, they're, you know, a lot of them are glass, so great. She locks the front door, which I think just has a glass window at the top, like a lot of doors. So maybe that's like a good door, but, you know, come on. Honestly, at this point, I would call the cops. Like, absolutely call the cops. If the guy on the phone is like, I'll gut you like a fish, I'm hanging up and calling the freaking cops. Like, I don't know what she's thinking here. They establish that she's in the middle of nowhere, like literally just in like rural California, cops are far away, that's not good. She starts to cry, asking what do you want, and he says to see what your insides look like. Ooh, not good. So Drew Barrymore's losing it, the doorbell rings, she is like, who's there, who's there? And goes to reach for the phone, probably to call the cops at this point, but it rings again. So she's like, oh my god, you know, picks it up, it's that guy again, and he says to never ask who's there, it's like a death wish in a horror movie. So this is kind of setting up that kind of referential self-aware vibe that we have in this movie, that's like, you're just feeding into every stupid thing you should do, like, why haven't you called the cops? If you ask who's there, then you're gonna get murdered. She's losing it. She screams down the phone that she does have a boyfriend. He's going to be there any second, even though she kind of said, you know, she didn't. And the caller says, is your boyfriend's name Steve? And we can tell from her reaction immediately that, oh, yes, (laughs) her boyfriend's name is definitely Steve. Oh, crap, Oli. And he tells her to turn on the patio lights. She turns on the patio lights and we see presumably Steve. That's what we can assume. In a letterman's jacket, he's duct taped to a chair, he's gagged, he's bleeding, he don't look good, okay? He, I mean, this is not good. This is when I would put the phone down and definitely call the cops. Like, oh my god, I know they're far away, but the sooner you call, the better. Like, there's so many people who've been stabbed and survived because you freaking called the cops, you know what I mean? So, Drew goes out there, she tries to help him, but the guy on, or I guess she doesn't go out there, she's like gonna go out there, I don't know. And the guy on the phone says not to go outside, so she just, like, stands at the door crying. This is classic, actually. This classic kind of, like, she was flirting at the beginning. I don't know if that's classic, but this classic kind of, like, helplessness, you know? I don't know. I feel like I would go out there if my husband was taped to a chair. Uh, Maybe not. God, I don't know what I would do in this, except call the cops! So the caller says he wants to play another game and tells her to turn off the patio light. He says he'll ask her a question about a movie. It's like movie trivia. And if she gets it right, Steve, the boyfriend, will live. Yay. So he says, who's the killer in Halloween? And um, she can't remember because she's so freaking panicked. And then all of a sudden says, it's Michael. It's Michael. She got it right. But then he says, okay, there's another question. Name the killer in Friday the 13th. And she emphatically says Jason. But apparently that is wrong because the original killer in the first Friday the 13th movie is Jason's mom. So that isn't good. And we next see Steve is gutted like a fish on the patio. We don't see the killer, but man, do we hear the squelching and see the guts falling out. I mean, I'm telling you, hang up the phone and call the cops. Like, barricade yourself in somewhere and call the cops. This is a tip from me to you guys. Call the cops. So now he says, for the final question in the game, what door am I at? The front door or the patio door? Answer correctly and she lives. Which I'm I'm not believing this at this point. You know, these people, if you have money, make a safe room. You know, even if it's just like a little closet room. You know, just please. And that is when a patio chair comes flying through those patio doors, those smashable patio doors. Told ya. Drew bolts, finally. The house is filled with smoke because that popcorn is on fire because she's left it alone with all, you know, the murder. She grabs a knife. Well done. And that's when she gets a glimpse of the killer, which I love the scream killer. He runs like an absolute goofball. He kind of looks like a character from Scooby-Doo, just like the goofiest runner. We just kind of see his black garment flapping. And she gets to another glass door. 
and backs into the yard and hides against a fence. She's got a knife in hand and a phone in the other hand. I mean, she's kept this phone. She's just obsessed with holding onto this phone. And she peers through the window and sees the killer for the first time. We catch a quick glimpse of his face. Ghost face. He's wearing a black cloak that's kind of tattered, and he's wearing this black and white mask. Did he see her hiding? We're not sure. He runs across the kitchen. We don't know. We don't know if he saw her. She saw him a little bit. What do we do? And actually, this, just a little bit of trivia here, this mask was actually not specially made for the film. It was made by a costume company called Fun World, and it's called the Weeping Ghost Mask. And what happened is production was scouting locations, and they found the mask in a box in a garage. And Wes Craven, the director, immediately said that it looked like the famous screen painting by Edward Munch. And if you don't know what that is, look that up. You'll know it as soon as you see it. There's literally an emoji of it. And so they kind of tried to recreate the mask in a million different ways so as not to have to do copyright on it. And it just didn't look right. It was weird. And in the end, they got the rights to the mask and the actual mask design. And they used that, which I'm so glad because it is so iconic now. I absolutely love it. So Drew looks out over her yard and it looks like, I mean, you can tell it's rural. It's like a cornfield or a vineyard or something. There's stuff growing in lines. There's a road. It's not, um, she's not close to anything. But then she sees a car with its headlights on driving towards the house. Ugh, thank God. She crawls onto the ground and the car pulls into the driveway and she pops up to see if the killer is there and holy crap holy, he is. He's at the glass window. He smashes his hand through the window. They struggle and she punches him in the face. So she makes a break for it. This is like, this is it. She runs past poor dead Steve like, too bad dude, like, you're you're done, so she ain't waiting. She still has that freaking phone in her hand. Does she have the knife at this point? I don't think so. You know, I don't remember when she dropped that, but she definitely has the phone. Maybe she does have the knife. We'll see if it comes up later. So she sees the car drive up to her door, but it's still pretty far away because this house and this plot is freaking huge. I'm telling you guys. Ghostface jumps through the window, landing on her. She sprints away again, but he's too fast for her. He grabs her face from behind and plunges the knife into her chest. She's on the floor, he's choking her, and she knees him, either in the gut or the balls, I don't know. If it's a guy, it could be the balls, but she knees him. And she tries to crawl away towards this car, which we see the people exiting exiting it now is probably her parents. It's an older couple walking into the home, kind of chatting. But because of the choking, Drew cannot scream. She tries to kind of scream out, but she lets out this barely audible, Mom! As her parents walk in and discover the ransacked house. And then Ghostface stabs Drew again as she pulls off his mask. Though we do not see the killer's face. But presumably she did, so she knows who it is. And I just want to say... I paused it at this point because I was like, okay, how long has it been? How long that you haven't called the cops? And we were at 12 minutes on this scene. And honestly, she probably would have had cops there by now or very closely thereafter if she called them at the very beginning. I actually googled the average police response time in the US and it's eight and a half minutes, but it can range from three minutes to 15 minutes. And I'm guessing the three minutes is like you're in a city, New York, where I am. There's literally a police station, fire, all like within five minutes. And 15 minutes is probably more rural. I'm guessing it could take 20 to 25 in some of these places where you are literally in the middle of nowhere. But she really should have. So the parents are taking taking it all in. They're calling Casey, Casey. So that's Drew Barrymore's name. They're saying, Casey, Casey. They find the flaming popcorn in the t- kitchen, and finally, the dad, someone, says, call the police. And because we're living in the 90s here, the phone that Casey is holding while she's, like, dying in the yard is the same line that her mom tries to call the cops on, and her mom hears her daughter being murdered. Oof. We see Casey being dragged across the grass, almost dead. 
she's kind of like muttering so you're like she's she's still around but possibly salvageable if they'd only called the cops here's my true crime ex- obsession coming out right here I think it was on like a I survived episode, but literally there's a story one time of like this girl was like raped and murdered or raped and attacked. She was gutted and nearly decapitated and left for dead. She and the guy thought she was dead. So she gets up. She's awake and alive. She gets up, holds her guts into her body. She said her head flopped back. So she had to kind of like hold on to her head. Jesus Christ. And she stumbles onto a roadway and flags someone down and actually lived. So don't ever give up. Call the cops. Please call the cops and never give up. Okay, back to the movie. The father tells the mother to drive to the neighbors. So they're like not close to anybody. The fact that they have to drive to their neighbor. And the mother's like, okay, they're like panicking. She goes out the door and sees her beloved daughter, Casey, strung up a tree most certainly dead at this point and baby that is how you open a movie i just want to pause here real quick because i cannot imagine being in the theater being like you know they'd advertise this with drew barrymore being a main character you're like oh i can't wait the et girl is back Uh, uh, uh. and she dies in the first 12 to 14 minutes of the movie genius and actually i um was reading that Drew Barrymore was originally asked to be Sydney, Neve Campbell's character, Nev Campbell, I don't know, um, the main character, Sydney, and she turned it down because she thought that she wanted to be Casey, that she hated the movies where it was like, obviously the original character was going to slog it through to the end, she wasn't going to die, so she wanted to shock people and said, you know, can I be um, Casey? And so she was. So we hear a giant thunderclap when the mom sees her body, sees Casey's body hanging, and then we cut to Neve Campbell. I'm going to call her Neve Campbell, or Sydney Sid, because I don't know if it's Neve or Nev, but I've always called her Neve Campbell. And we see our scream darling, Sydney Prescott, and she's typing on a computer and hears a thunderclap in the distance, which I'm guessing is the same thunderclap, that we're supposed to believe that that thunderclap when the mom saw Casey's body, is the same thunderclap that Sydney hears in the distance. Sydney's wearing a super twee white pajama dress with little flowers on it, and all of a sudden she hears glass breaking outside her window. That ain't good. She goes to check it out, and some crazy teenage boy pops up in the window, and it's Billy, Skeet Ulrich, which, first of all, what a great name. Second of all, what a dish. He. I don't know. I think some people might look back at him and be like, uh, weird. I don't know. But man, he has it all going on. And I actually recently saw him at Spookala. Spookala? Spookala? I don't know. In Tampa, Florida. And man, does he look good. He's just got the gray aging, looks the same. Real, real good stuff. So Sydney's dad comes to check on her because, you know, she screamed when uh, Billy came up the, uh, not the fire escape, we're not in New York, people, came into her window, and we establish he's leaving for the weekend for an expo, so he's leaving Sydney alone for a long weekend. He tells her he's going to be at the Hilton, by the airport or something, and he leaves. So cut back to Billy and Sydney, and apparently Billy just watched The Exorcist, and it got him thinking about Sydney. Red flag, ladies, red frickin' flag. If your boyfriend or significant other says, hey, I just watched The Exorcist and it made me think of you, bail. Bail immediately. Maybe call the cops even. He said that it was edited for TV, so all the good stuff was cut out, which made him think of Sydney. Because he basically wants to get in her pants. And, you know, she's obviously been like, nah, I'm good. Um... They end up kind of making out and doing some over the clothes stuff, as Sydney says. And um, he ends up leaving. She flashes him on the way out. We don't see anything. This isn't like we see boobs or anything. We see the shot from behind. They giggle and he's gone. Cut to Woodsboro High School the next day. Presumably the next day because it was night the day before. The place is swarming with cops and reporters. Sydney walks on the campus, kind of looking pensive, 
and she hears a newsreader talking about the murders of the two teenagers. And who is it? It's Monica Geller. Jokes, it's Gail Weathers. So, it's actually Courtney Cox who played Monica in Friends, and now she's playing a radically different character, Gail Weathers, which actually, that was something she wanted. She apparently wrote a letter to Wes Craven, the director, because she was desperate for this role. And Monica was such a um, kind of tightly wound but nice role. She was very nice, a little bit OCD, but Gail Weather is like a bitch. So she wanted to be that character. She wanted to prove that she could do another type of character. She didn't want to be typecast. And she's actually wearing this gorgeous lime green skirt suit that just sets off everything. It's like power bitch suit gorgeous color 90s everything i love it tatum sydney's friend gives her a bit of a jump scare and um like there's so many jump scares in this that mean nothing it's just they're trying to keep you on the edge of your seat and uh she's actually dressed and colored a lot like casey drew barrymore's character she's blonde but like the worst blonde for her skin tone it doesn't work at all and she's wearing a cream sweater So I wonder if this is another kind of Hitchcockian vibe they're trying to go for here. They talk about the murders, they were brutal, it's horrible, and everyone at school is being interrogated. And Tatum says, you know, it's the worst crime in Woodsboro in years since, you know, and trails off awkwardly. So we get kind of a vibe here that there has been a crime that's a little bit awkward that they don't want to talk about in the past. Sydney is called from class to be interrogated. And we see our favorite Fonzie, Henry Winkler. He's the principal. We see our favorite cop, Dewey, a.k.a. David Arquette, and the sheriff is there. They start asking her questions, and actually the principal, Henry Winkler, touches Sydney's face in a way that makes me want to vom. And I don't know if this is them trying to be like, he's creepy, he must be the killer, or like, Sydney's cool with it. She acts like she knows him very well. It's a small town. But I wonder if that was them trying to be like, signal, he could be the guy. We cut to the lunch break, and I love the blocking on this scene. It's kind of like, um, God, what is the, I'm not religious, guys, but the painting with Jesus before he's crucified with all of the disciples all kind of laid out. It's really a gorgeous scene. The coloring is great. Um, We see Sydney sitting in Billy's lap. Tatum is cozied up to Matthew Lillard's character, Stu, and Jamie Car- uh, Jamie Kennedy's character, Randy, is like the fifth wheel in this whole thing. It's set in California, but in rural California, and I just love the vibe. It's like fall trees, but it's super sunny because they're in California. I just love the whole vibe. They discuss if the killer could be a woman. Basic Instinct had a female killer, says Tatum. Then Sydney asks, how do you gut someone? Which is like, okay, dude, that comes from, I'm just going to tell you right now, my dad died when I was four years old. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know. And when I meet someone and tell someone that, I know if that has happened to them before. And here's how. If I say my dad died when I was four, if they have had a young parental death, they will say, how did they die? Because they're so comfortable with it. They're comfortable with death. But if that hasn't happened to somebody, they get quiet and don't want to talk. They do, they kind of like, oh, oh sorry. Oh. So with Sydney saying, how do you gut someone? That makes me think she's kind of close to death or murder, that she's experienced that. And apparently, Stu knows how to gut somebody. Interesting. And he used to date Casey, we established, Drew Barrymore's character. So a link, maybe. But Tatum says that Stu was with her last night. You know, doing the deed is kind of suggested. Sydney gets uncomfortable with all the murder talk and she walks away. We see her getting off a school bus at her house. Another amazing abandoned rural, like it's in the middle of nowhere, like on a hill. And I've driven through rural California several times and it looks just like this. I actually didn't look up where they filmed it and I probably should have because If it wasn't in rural California, I'd be freaking surprised. Maybe Oregon, but it really looks like rural California. And her house is huge. Like, gorgeous, white, picket fence mansion. Um, Not a good sign it's in the middle of the nowhere, you know. 
And so Sydney's talking to Tatum on the phone. Her dad's not there, remember? she He's gone to an expo. We don't know where her mom is. And um, Sydney says, I'm going to, you know, stay over at your house. And Sydney says the murders are like deja vu. So something has happened before. Tatum promises she'll be there by 7 p.m. and they hang up. Sydney goes inside and locks her incredibly fragile glass door like it means anything. I'm telling you guys, glass doors mean nothing. Sydney sits down to watch TV and we see Gail Weathers, um, Courtney Cox's character, the newsreader, on TV talking about how only one year ago Maureen Prescott, Sydney's mom, was raped and murdered in Woodsboro. So that's the connection. Sydney... Sydney's mom a year ago was murdered. That's the deja vu they're talking about. That's the awkward crime that they've been talking about. Sydney falls asleep on the couch and we see the clock reads 7.15, which is later than Tatum said she would be. And the phone rings. Oh my God. It's Tatum. Okay, thank God. And she says she's on the way. She just needs to grab a movie. The phone rings again and Sydney's thinking it's Tatum. But actually, it's creepy sex line voice, Mr. Ghostface. Sydney, in my opinion, that's what I would say. You hear it right away. Sydney thinks it's Randy messing with her, but it's not. And just like the first time with Casey, he asks about her favorite scary movies, and she says she doesn't like them, they're stupid. Specifically, she says she doesn't like to see the woman run up the stairs when she should be running out the door. It's insulting, which I completely agree, and bank that for later, because that's going to be relevant very soon in this movie. He asks her if she's alone, they go back and forth, she goes out onto the porch, because he says, I can see you, I'm here, da 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 and she's like, I'm going to call your bluff and go out onto the porch. Like, she's not crying, she's giving, like, those, like, try it, dude vibes, and it's in complete contrast with Casey, because... Sydney is like, you're joking, this is stupid, you're an idiot, instead of like being scared. And I love that. I love that she's like coming in with this power. She accuses him of being Randy again on the phone. And that's when he says, if you hang up on me, you'll die just like your mother. And that's when we're thinking, okay, crap Or at least I knew it was Ghostface. I think everyone watching it did. But Sydney all of a sudden is like, ooh okay, this is maybe not good. And he says stuff that makes you think that maybe this is the same person who murdered Sydney's mother. Sydney runs back inside and she locks her super secure glass door, but the door's been open, so anyone could have walked in there. And this is definitely when she could call the cops again. But before she can even think about that, Ghostface jumps out of the coat closet, swipes her with a knife in that goofy way. I absolutely love it. A struggle ensues, and this is where the comment from earlier about running out the door instead of upstairs just comes back to haunt her. Sydney tries to bolt out the door, but because she's panicked, she'd already put the chain on, because that's what you do when you're trying to be secure, but she's panicked, and you have to close a door to get the chain off, then reopen it again, and she just doesn't have the time or wherewithal to do that, so she has to run up the stairs and go ghost face makes chase. She locks herself in her bedroom. She tries to call someone, but the line is dead. So she goes to her computer, which I guess is set up to make phone calls. And I just want to know if this is a real thing. If you were an American teenager in 96 with a bunch of money, please tell me if this is real. She types 911 into the computer and a 911 operator responds by typing, what is your emergency? And I'm just like, is that real? I don't know. Um, Ghostface is gone, and all of a sudden, Billy is at her window again. Hmm. Interesting. Sydney is happy to see him, and he says he came through the window because the door is locked and heard screaming. Which is plausible, totally plausible, but why didn't Ghostface just kill you both? Hmm, I don't know. He's comforting her, and a cell phone falls out of his pocket. So now Sydney thinks Billy's the killer. She goes to run out the door and is met by a ghost face mask, but it's actually Dewey holding up the mask against the door. They both scream, but the cops are here, uh, so we're good. He says he found the mask. Interesting. So is it Dewey? 
and they arrest Billy because Dewey's feeling like we caught him, he was here, you know, da da da. Tatum pulls up. We find out that Tatum and Dewey are brother and sister. Super cute. That's why Dewey and Sydney are comfortable with each other. And it's just a small town vibe like that. Gail Weathers shows up being like super inappropriate, sticking her head in car windows, trying to talk to Sydney, just being a nuisance. She's just like, she's annoying, but I love the character. She's giving such girl power, obnoxious vibes. Like, if this was a guy, you'd be like, yeah, he's a journalist. And I'm like, sure, you know. And she's really rude to her cameraman. I forget what his name is. I feel like it's Randy, but it's not. It's that other character's name. So I forget what his name is, but she's just like, you tub keep moving, you're so annoying, whatever. Sydney's at the police station, and Dewey says that he can't track down her dad because apparently he's not registered at the hotel that he told Sydney. So is it her dad? Is it her dad who killed her mom and is now, I don't know. Literally all the men in this movie are a suspect at this point. Dewey, is he a red herring? Is it Billy? Is it the dad? We don't know. Billy's being interviewed by the sheriff, and the sheriff asks him about his cellular telephone. Love that. And Billy's like, everyone has one. I didn't do it. His lawyer is his dad. And then when there's more questioning, the dad actually is like, wait, I'm not sure I believe you. Which is like, wow, okay, your dad doesn't believe you? Oof. Um, They say they gotta get his cell phone records, which I'm guessing in 96 takes forever. And Gail Weathers shows up again. She's being obnoxious, but again, love the girl power suit vibe. Dewey realizes they can't track the purchase of the ghost face costume because it's just like a common Halloween costume. So in this world, the ghost face mask is like just normal. In our world, now it's just known as Scream, right? If any, if you see anyone out there, you're like, it's the Scream mask. Sydney, Tatum, and Dewey leave out the back of the police station to avoid all the press, but Gail's way too smart for that and catches them leaving. And we find out that Gail is writing a book about Sydney's mom's murder and Sydney socks her in the frickin' face. Good job. We cut to Sydney and Tatum staying in Tatum's house in her bedroom. They discuss Billy being the killer. We're not really sure. I mean, it's red herrings all over the place. And then Tatum's mom comes in and says there's a call for Sydney, but it's not her dad. Crapoli, it's Ghostface. He starts taunting her, saying that Billy isn't the killer, and just being a general douche magoosh, really. Sydney's super freaked out. It's not good. The next morning, we see Sydney and Tatum watching TV while they eat breakfast, and we see that a man called Cotton Weary is the convicted killer of Sydney's mom being talked about on TV. And we find out then from Dewey that Billy's cell phone records came back and he didn't make the calls. So, innocent? We shall see. Dewey drives Tatum and Sydney to school. They're hounded by press again. And Sydney checks in with Gail Weathers. She wants to talk to her because Gail thinks Cotton Weary, the guy who was convicted of Sydney's mom's murder, is innocent. Sydney said she ID'd him, though, because she saw someone leave her house wearing cotton's blood covered coat and apparently cotton and sydney's mom were you know having an affair on the side and gail says is like you know that could have been anyone wearing that coat which she's not wrong so you know we'll see sydney runs into billy and says i don't think it's you now because of the cell phone records and billy says like of course it wasn't me i was in jail when you received that second phone call at tatum's And he's like, you need to get over your mom's death. But her anniversary, apparently, of the death is literally tomorrow. Like, shut up, dude. You know, you're like, your girlfriend's, I mean, okay, maybe they're 17 or something, but your girlfriend's mom was raped and murdered less than a year ago. We see Henry Winkler, the principal, dressing down some kids in his office because they've been running around wearing ghost masks. Uh, ghost face masks so now we don't even know who's who like someone could be running around just wearing the mask for kicks for jokes you know and then we see Sid in the bathroom some people are talking crap about her and they leave and all of a sudden ghost face bursts out of one of the bathroom stalls and she runs out of the bathroom he tries to chase her so maybe a prank we're not really sure 
Dewey shows up at the school and Gail is super flirting with him, which is super cute considering the actors get together from this movie in real life. But, oh my god, she tells him you don't look a day over 12 when she's flirting with him, like it's a compliment. Like, oh my god, it's so funny to me because I think that was a self-aware moment that, you know, if she was a man to, uh, a, you know, an adult woman, you don't look a day over 12. Like, oh, cute. you know, like this kind of self-referential, disgusting comment that I just think is hilarious. And then we hear over the tannoy or the speaker of the school that classes are suspended and now there's a curfew so all the students head home and Stu says that he's that's tatum's boyfriend says that he's gonna have a party at his house tonight strength in numbers blowing off steam let's do it we then cut to the principal's office he gets murdered by ghostface which i kind of wonder what the point of this murder was i feel like it was all the students being attacked and i wonder from this did they choose to murder him to eliminate him and by they i mean the writers and the director to say okay henry winkler's dead he ain't the murderer obviously so you can kind of cut that off your list i'm not absolutely sure we see tatum and sid at what we can assume is tatum's house talking about cotton weary and sid's mother's death and apparently there were a lot of rumors about Sid's mom doing a lot of guys on the side. Sid asks if Tatum believes the rumors, and this is, I love this, this is peak 90s. If you weren't alive then, you just wouldn't know. And Tatum says, there's only so many times you can hear the gerbil Richard Gere story and not believe it. Oh my god, I'm not going to repeat this story here, you can google it, it's super easy to find. But that rumor, I'm telling you from about the age that I was 12, I used to hear that rumor. I used to read it in magazines, like this wackadoo rumor about like Richard Gere sex and a gerbil. Like it seems so silly looking back now, but oh my god, like great reference. And as they go inside, we see Ghostface running through Tatum's yard. Cut to Randy at work at the video store, classic 90s video store. That's where everyone was at on a Friday, Saturday night. And apparently he's an expert on movies. Stu is there bugging him and Randy says the killer has to be Billy. It's classic and simple. The boyfriend, there's always a formula. And Stu makes fun of him and suggests it's Sydney's dad. And Randy says, dude, the dad's probably already dead. That's like why we can't get a hold of him, which I think is genius. Like, you might be right, dude. Billy shows up and accuses Randy of being the murderer, who actually admits that he's a classic choice because he's like a denier. He's on the fringes. Um, and then we see all of the local stores closing up for the curfew. So Sid and Tatum are at the store, like a grocery store, presumably getting snacks for this stew party. And they're talking about sex and how Sid has intimacy issues, you know, because her mom was murdered, raped and murdered less than a year ago. And Sid's like, yeah, but Billy's been really patient and da 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 And while they're doing this, Dewey checks in at the police station and we find out from the sheriff that the ghost face calls were from Sid's dad. That ain't good. Dewey says maybe the cell phone was cloned. Clever duck. This guy... I love the Dewey character, how they set him up like this innocent, kind of twee, like, uh, naive character. But he's actually super intelligent. Just because he's a nice guy, he's actually quite intelligent. And um, I just love that about his character. We see Sid and Tatum get to Stu's party. Another ridiculous house is seen. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. I'm telling, please tell me what these people do for work. Please. Because it ain't podcasting and it isn't what I'm doing on the side of this. People are doing beer bongs, playing music, da 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 da. Gail Weathers pulls up to take a peek and Dewey catches her. So Dewey and Gail decide to check out the party together, which I think people would look at this that like Dewey's naive. But again, I think he just knows that she's innocent. I think he just is like, I don't think it's a big deal that she's here. Like, sure, it's annoying for Sydney, but, you know, I just don't think he thinks that she has any murderous intentions or criminal intentions, I guess. However, <laughs> she does sneak a camera onto a shelf in the living room 
to be recording and capturing the party, which I'm not sure if that's legal in California. I think you're not allowed to. I'm just going to go back to my Kim K, um, Taylor Swift, uh, Kanye West um, vibes. Is it illegal to record someone without them knowing in California or New York? Now I can't remember. One of those. So I'm not sure. And I really wish at this point, like getting into this, that I could watch this movie for the first time. Because I don't remember who I thought the killer was. I'm sure I was going back and forth between a few different people. But man, I wish I could remember where my brain was at. Because with some of the other Scream movies that I've seen, I'm kind of like, it's them. No, it's here. And some others, I'm like, no, it's got to be them. And now I'm not sure what I thought with this one. Now we see Tatum go to the garage. She's getting beer for the party and Ghostface appears. Oh no, not Tatum. I have a feeling this is a Hitchcockian thing, that all of the blonde Hitchcockian women are just going to die. They, it's just going to be bad for them. And Neve Campbell, Sydney's character, is a brunette. And so is Gail Weathers. I don't want to spoil it for you, but they live. So it's like, oh, if you're blonde, are you like totally effed? Like, I'm going to have to look at these other movies. No, actually, that's not true. But for this first one, I think that's what they did. And so Tatum thinks this is a joke. You know, this is Randy. This is some guy playing, but it's no joke. He cuts her arm. She tries to escape through the cat flap in the garage and gets stuck. And Ghostface turns on the garage opener and Tatum is chippity chop squish in the door and her dead body is left hanging. The party's shutting down because of the curfew and everything, and Sid's heading out but can't find Tatum, but Billy shows up. Billy and Sid go up to Stu's parents' bedroom to talk. There's a bit of a discussion, some apologies, they make out, and they end up having sex in Stu's parents' bed while the other kids are watching Halloween, the movie, downstairs in the living room. And Randy actually says that one. there's three rules about um being in a horror movie so that you can survive you have to be the virgin you cannot have sex that's just one you cannot drink or do drugs that piggybacks on the back of that like no sinning and you can never say i'll be right back because you won't be i think that's so genius because he's so freaking right like so good meanwhile dewey and gail check out an abandoned car down the street then the phone rings in Stu's house and Randy picks it up. He finds out the principal is dead and he was gutted and hung from a goalpost on the school field. Which I realized watching this movie at that point, Ghostface loves to hang people, like display the body. Because I guess Steve wasn't at the beginning, but Casey was. She was hung. Tatum ended up being hung. The principal was hung. It's just interesting. That's like his MO, his vibe, I guess. Then everyone except Randy, Sid, and Billy, because they're having sex upstairs, and maybe Stu, I'm not sure at this point, because it's kind of a, a pulled out, a wide shot, you can't tell who's leaving, but you see that Randy's still there, and you know that Sid and Billy are having sex upstairs. But they rush out of the house, get in their cars, and end up knocking Gail and Dewey off the road into the woods, where they share a little smoochy, because they're looking for that car, right? That abandoned car, so they got knocked off the road. And as they're smooching, they kind of look to the side and they find the car and realize that it's actually Sid's dad's car. So they rush back to the house because now Dewey's assuming that actually the dad is the killer. And why is he here? He's here to kill everybody. We see Sid and Billy finishing up after sex in Stu's parents' bedroom. And Sid asks Billy, who did you call? with the one phone call in jail. You know, when you're in jail, you get one phone call. They go back and forth. Um, he's like, it's my dad. No, it was a da, 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 da. And we know that Sid received a ghost face call at Tatum's house when Billy was in jail. So that's why she's kind of like, mm. the answer from Billy does not convince Sidney and she plays it off. And while he's trying to convince her, Ghostface appears behind him and stabs him, dude. Billy reaches out to Sid but falls on the floor and now a chase ensues between Sidney and Ghostface. They go up and down the stairs, in and out of rooms. I'm telling you, this house is California rich big. It is, there's a wing here, a wing there. You go down the stairs, you go up those, it's crazy. She gets to an attic 
and then climbs onto the roof. Ghostface grabs her, but she falls onto a boat below. Told you, California rich. Boat. And Ghostface is gone. So that's when Sid sees Tatum's body hanging. She runs off, finds Gail's truck, and the cameraman lets Sid in. And that's when we see on the hidden camera that Gail placed in Stu's living room, we see Randy on the hidden camera in the living room, and Ghostface is coming up behind him. But then the cameraman remembers there's a 30 second delay. So if they're seeing Ghostface come up behind Randy in the living room right now, that was 30 seconds ago. And Ghostface pops up, of course, slits the cameraman's throat, stabs Sydney in the shoulder, and she escapes and goes off running again. Dewey and Gail make it back to Stu's house, thinking that Sydney's dad is there as Ghostface. Gail goes to call for backup, and Dewey enters the house. I mean, what a badass. Dewey is so cool. Like, all these cops you hear about hiding, not going towards the murders, not going towards the crime, the violence. I mean, he is just like, what a powerhouse. I love his character. And I always forget that Tatum is his sister. You know, I think, I just forget that, because she dies early. Like, that sucks, and... Oh, she's such a great character, too. So sad. So, Sydney tries to wave down Gale, but Gale crashes, like, super intensely. You're kind of like, uh oh, that didn't look good. Sid runs back to the house screaming for Dewey, and we see Dewey come out of the house, and he's been stabbed in the back by Ghostface. No, not Dewey. Please, not Dewey. So, Sid locks herself in Dewey's car, which is a police car, and it's one of those old 90s car. I mean, we still get them now. It's not a wind down or even electrical. It's not electrical. It's not a wind down. It's one of those ones where you have to like push the tab, you know, the thing that sticks up and stuff. You have to push it in to lock each door. And she does that, but apparently Ghostface has the keys and he's unlocking each door and then the trunk. And she's calling on the police radio, like, get the freak over here, dude. And then Randy and Stewie show up. Sydney's running back into Stu's house. And Randy and Stu are right there. And Sydney doesn't really know what to believe, so she grabs Dewey's gun, because Dewey's in the doorway, like, stabbed in the back. So she grabs his gun and points it at Randy and Stu. And I absolutely love Matthew Lillard's performance here as Stu. He is, he is perfection in this movie. He's so freaking unhinged and hilarious. Like, it's serious, but he brings just the right amount of levity and gravity and hilarity to this part. I just love it. And that is when we see a bloodied but alive Billy tumbling down the stairs. So Sid slammed the door shut because she's like, sorry, Randy and Stu, I ain't buying it. And Billy tumbles down the stairs and Billy's like, no, no, it's cool. It's cool. And he opens the door and lets Randy in. And Randy comes in, and Randy and Sid are like, oh, and that is when we see Billy's entire demeanor change. If you've seen Primal Fear with Richard Gere, gerbil, and, um, oh, crap, now I can't even think, Edward Norton. Edward Norton's, like, first role as, like, he was, like, a teenager or early 20s. This reminds me of that so much. I'm not going to give it away, but if you haven't seen Primal Fear, goddamn watch it. It's so good. And we see Billy's entire demeanor change. It's him. He's the killer. We know it. He shoots Randy. He says that the stabbing was fake and all of the blood on his body is dyed corn syrup like they used in the movie Carrie. So if you've seen Carrie, that's I think an 80s movie. Um, Again, I don't watch horror movies, but she's covered in blood at the end, and it's dyed corn syrup, basically. Sydney can't believe it, tries to run, and she runs into Stu, who then reveals he's also the killer. So that's how they did it. Two killers and a voice-altering machine. They start tormenting her, passing their gun back and forth. There's some super murder homoerotic vibes between Stu and Billy in this scene um love it and they admit to killing sid's mom and framing cotton weary she asks why and they say there's no motive and actually randy had said when he was in the video store with Stu that in the millennium motives are incidental i 
freaking love it. He's just so clever. But then we find out the motive actually is that Sid's mom, this is what Billy says. I mean, I don't know if it's true, but this is what Billy said. Sid's mom was having an affair with Billy's dad, and that's why Billy's mom left the family. So basically, Billy grew up without a mom. You know, his dad was probably upset about that, and he just had like a shitty time. So that was his motive. And Stu says he has a surprise for Sid. Surprise! It's Sid's Sid's dad blooded and tied up. So their plan is to basically frame Sid's dad on the anniversary of Sid's mom's death, They're going to pretend that Sid's dad tried to kill them, killed Sid, and um, basically to do that, Billy and Stu have to stab each other very gently. And this has happened many times in murders where the killer, like he, it's usually his wife. I mean, look, if you're getting murdered, it's almost always your husband. Eh, Sorry, it is. Basically, what usually happens is they'll, like, kill, the husband will kill his wife, like, stab her super hard to death. And then he'll, like, slice his arm, maybe stab himself in the side, but not, like, hit an organ, like the liver or the kidneys or anything, like, in your torso, but on the side. And then say, well, I was attacked by the killer as well, when in fact, he was the killer. So Billy stabs Stu, and it seems like it was pretty deep. Like, you know, he's like gentle and it's not gentle. Then Stu stabs Billy because he's kind of mad at how deep Billy went on his stab. And then Billy's like, hand over the knife. And Stu's like, no. And they just start, they're just going crazy. And they start like stabbing each other. Billy stabbing Stu again multiple times. And then Stu says he's feeling woozy. And while this is happening, There's kind of cuts between Sid and her dad, and they're making kind of knowing eyes at each other, but at this point, you're like, man, these guys are freaking idiots. Sydney's got the game on this. Like, she's she's got a plan. Stu goes to grab the gun, but it's gone. He says he left it on the table right there, and it's gone. And that's when Gail pops up. She's fine from her crash. She took the gun. She points it at Billy tries to fire it but unfortunately the safety was on she doesn't you know she don't understand guns she does i don't know i wouldn't know if a safety was on a gun and billy knocks her out and she falls on dewey's body in the doorway so she's not dead dewey might be we don't know they turn around and realize that sydney's made off with her dad and hidden somewhere or run off or something the phone rings billy picks it up and it's sydney she's taunting them Billy tells Stu to go look for them, but Billy has cut him too deep. And he says, I think you cut me too deep, man. I think I'm dying. It's so, dude, his freaking performance, Matthew Lillard, is, again, genius. It is one of my favorite performances in this entire movie. Sid asks Stu over the phone what his motive is. And Stu says, peer pressure, I'm far too sensitive. Like, it's, I mean, it's not wrong. I mean, they're playing into another trope or reality. But oftentimes when there's two killers, there's like a psychopath or sociopath. And they kind of hook in a guy or person who is like, "Uh, I guess I had a bad life. I don't know. So, so good. I love it. Billy runs around the house looking for Sid, generally going crazy. He's like breaking up pillows. He's just like, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden, ghost face, so we got Stu and Billy, not in costume, and all of a sudden, ghost face jumps out of a closet and stabs Billy with an umbrella, like a big umbrella, you know, with the pointy part. And we realize it's Sydney, dressed up in the costume. She kicks the gun away, but Stu comes running out. They fight, and Sid throws that giant TV on Stu's head, electrocuting him. I think that's pretty much a done deal at that point. Randy pops up. He's alive. But then so is Billy. So they're fighting Billy and Sid. And just when Billy is about to stab Sid, Gail pops up. I mean, so many jump scares, man. Gail pops up and shoots him in the chest. Yes, she knows how to take the safety off now. Billy has one last jump scare and Sid shoots him in the head, does a nice little kill shot. Her dad bursts out of the closet, and then we see Dewey being taken to hospital. 
Yeah. He's alive. Gail has somehow gotten another cameraman. There's like three people walking with her outside the house. And she's telling the story in front of Stu's house while still blooded and probably super traumatized. The sun sets on Woodsboro. And that is the movie. So, man, what a wild ride. This movie is perfection. I would rate this a 10 out of 10, a 12 out of 10. There is nothing about it that bothers me. There's nothing about it that isn't right. It's so succinct. And there are no parts where, you know when you watch a movie and you're like, oh god, this is like the slow part. This is like the second act slowdown. Not at all. It is perfection the entire time. Thank you guys for listening to my second episode of Film Fixation. Next month, I'm going to be doing a Thanksgiving episode. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to tell you so that you can watch the movie in case you haven't seen it. It's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. It is another perfect movie that I haven't looked it up on Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm sure it's up in the 90s. It has Steve Martin in it. It's, uh, and John Candy. It's from, oh, I can't remember now, late 80s, early 90s. And, um, I feel like a lot of people, maybe millennials, haven't seen it. But from the literal get-go, it is fast-paced. It is incredible. And Kevin Bacon is in the beginning, um, like totally unexpected. I don't even think he was famous back then. He was just in it as an actor. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do plane, trains, and automobiles. I don't know what I'm doing for Christmas yet. Could be Home Alone. Could be the Santa Claus. Could be Jingle All the Way. Let's be honest, it's probably going to be one of those three because those I've hyper fixated on and I watch every year. So I hope to see you again on the next Film Fixation episode. I do it the second to Thursday, the second to last Thursday of every month. And I can't wait to see you next Wednesday for the next weekly episode of My Brain is a Wonderland, Season 2.